So we're here in Daniel chapter 8. If you haven't been with us, um, you know, we're, we're marching through. Again, two weeks ago, we went through that entire chapter. It was a lot. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to find breaking points for these whole things. And, and so today we're going to go through the whole chapter. It shouldn't be quite as long as we were two weeks ago. But um, I want to just remind you where we're at. Uh, it's important to kind of remember the broader context. Uh, Israel is captive here in Babylon uh, for these 70 years. God uh, saw fit to, to uh, chastise the nation for 70 years, allowing them to be taken captive uh, by the Babylonians. We're, we're near the end of that time. Uh, now, chronologically, you know, we got to chapter 6, but then we have these visions where Daniel's going back. But when we ended chapter 6, we're, we're near the end of their time of captivity. And Daniel is, he's written about these prophetic visions that God uh, has given him. They're, they're prophecies of what's going to take place uh, in the future. And, you know, the first six chapters were filled with really obvious application, right? Like, like how to stand and, and, and not compromise in, 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 you know, in the, while we're living in Babylon. Uh, so there, it was filled with all kinds of those vivid illustrations that, that directly apply to us. This, these latter chapters, they're technical. And there's, there's application, but it, it, it's, you got to work to find the application. Uh, the, the broad application is um, God is going to humble the nations. Just as we saw over and over again as God was dealing with the kings, he's humbling each one. Um, God's going to humble all the world leaders and eventually uh, remove all the, the world kingdoms as he ushers in his own kingdom, the kingdom of God. So uh, it's, it's technical today, but uh, I think there is some good application as we'll see. Let's go ahead and begin. Uh, we're going to just read it in uh, chunks because the, the text does kind of go back and forth. We have the vision, uh, then we have the interpretation of the vision. And so uh, you'll have to pay close attention if you want to track with me. Uh, we're going to read the first 14 verses though. Daniel chapter 8. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam, and I looked in the vision, and I found myself be beside the Ulai Canal. Then I lifted up my eyes, and I looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, southward, and no other beast could stand before him. Nor was there anyone to rescue from his power, but he did as he pleased and magnified himself. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram, which had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So we hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power." Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. And in its place, there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was torn down. 
And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and, uh, and perform its will and prosper. Verse 13, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? While the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Daniel's recalling a vision, a vision that he's previously had, just as he did in chapter 7. He's going back now chronologically and saying, hey, during the, you know, in chapter 7, it was the first uh, year of the rule of Belshazzar. Here, this is the third year of the rule of Belshazzar. He's going back and he's saying, I've had these visions. Now I'm, I'm recording them. This one, you know, we've got these animal images and they're, by all accounts, they're weird. They're strange. I don't know if you've ever looked at some of the drawings of some of these things. It's like they're very, very strange to us in, in, in some ways. Of course, the, these two are somewhat normal, but uh, the previous ones certainly are. And then when you get into Revelation and you see some of the, the imagery, it's, it's wild. So we've got a ram. The ram has two unequal horns. We've got a goat. It's got a horn. It, the, the discussion of horns, it, it has to do with strength. It has to do with power. So anytime you read about these horns, think, okay, this, this has to do symbolically with power, with strength. This goat has a horn between its eyes. Uh, that horn gets broken and is replaced by four other horns. It gets divided up uh, into four other horns. And then... Uh, the, the third really significant thing that he focuses a lot of attention on, as we'll see, is there's a little horn that comes up out of one of the four. Do you guys understand this vision? I think you read it and you just kind of go, all right. He's got this vision of these different animals. And, and uh, again, it's, it's likely that this is a reoccurring dream. It's, a, it's possibly a reoccurring vision. I can't say that with certainty, but you guys know what it's like when you wake up from a dream. You don't remember all of it. And uh, he evidently, though, he remembers all of this. And so he's recording it, but he doesn't understand it. So, so we should take you know, a little bit of comfort in that. It's, it's not intended that we would just look at this and go, oh, oh, I get it. It's a, it's a prophetic dream. And, and Daniel, he wants to know. Like, let's, let's go on and read now, because uh, we're going to go back and forth a little bit, but, but I want to just read his, uh, his concern here now, beginning verse 15, 15 through 19. He says, when I had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, standing before me, was one who looked like a man, and I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Ulai, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. So he came near to where I was standing. When he came, I was frightened. I fell on my face. But he said to me, Son of man, understand the vision pertains to the time of the end. Now while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand upright. He said, behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. It seems as though he's awake, like he's awakened from this, but he is seeking to understand it. Like he's, he's thinking about this vision that he's had. He's thinking about it. And he says, I sought to understand it. And, and, and he's visited by Gabriel, who is instructed, there is a voice that says to Gabriel, tell him what it's all about. So this is the first time in scripture that we have an angel named. It's, 
It's kind of cool. I'm sure it was a wild experience for Daniel. But, but here's the thing. God knows, God knows that Daniel wants to know the answers. Like, like there is the sense that, that, that God's completely aware that Daniel desires to understand this vision. And of course, it's, it's God's plan as he unfolds this whole thing to give it to Daniel. But I think there's something about the idea that he says in verse 15, I sought, I sought to understand it. We saw the same thing in chapter 7, if you recall, back in verse 16. I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of these things. Daniel wants to know. Now, one of the frustrating things for all of us is that God doesn't always tell us everything. Does that frustrate you? Frustrates me? God, why does this happen? What, what, what is this all about? And even, even as we look to the scriptures, there's many things for which we, eh, we got a little bit of information, but we don't have the whole picture. But I want to know. As they say, inquiring minds want to know, right? He, he, he tells us not everything, but he does tell us what we need to know. He tells us what we need to know. Now, Daniel, in all of history, Daniel is a pretty unique individual. Although he's in good company with, you know, with the other prophets. Daniel, as we've said before, his, his, these prophecies, these visions, hold the key to understanding the things of the end. And God is using him. God's using him because he's the, he's the guy who, as we talked about previously, he's the guy who's there, right? He's where he's supposed to be, and he's faithful to God. And so God says, this is the guy that I can use. He, he, I'll give him the vision. He'll faithfully write it down. He'll faithfully communicate it to the kings and to all of us. Einstein famously said, I want to know God's thoughts. The rest are mere details. You guys ever heard that quote before? He's someone that we point to and say, this guy was brilliant. And though he wasn't a, a, a Christian believer in the sense of you know, accepting Jesus Christ and believing the word of God. He understood in his brilliance, he understood that pursuing God, understanding God was the highest and most noble thing. Actually, the full quote is, is, a, little bit, is a little bit more. He actually said, I want to know how God created this world. I'm not interested in this or that phenomenon in the spectrum of this or that element. I want to know his thoughts. The rest are details. It's a noble thing. It's the highest intellectual pursuit. To desire to know, to know God personally, but then also just to know his will. And the Bible tells us this over and over again. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, it says, The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. It's like, here's the smartest thing. Get smart in the things of God. Here's wisdom. Get wisdom. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, the, it's the greatest pursuit. And James 1.5 is, is so encouraging uh, for all of us as believers. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach. It will be given to him. I think so many things, so many things in life, we go through in ignorance rather than asking God, God, what is the answer? Well, I would say primarily 99.9% .9 of what we need to know is right here. Amen? It's here. But then in all the issues of life, we can come to God and we can ask him. We should. It's a noble thing. I, I just love Daniel as an example. He says he desires to understand these things. And we are blessed because of that desire. So uh, Gabriel begins to give Daniel understanding of the vision. He falls into a deep sleep, it says. It's comforting to know that even when the angels are preaching, people fall asleep. 
Oh, if you guys only knew what it was like sometimes watching people. <laughs> this is a different kind of sleep. He's in a some kind of a trance or something. God's, you know, allowing him this so he can further give him information. Now, as we are seeking to understand this, the first thing we need to note that's that's listed in here, I think that's very, very important is what's in verse 17, 19, and 26. Look at verse 17. It says, This vision pertains to the time of the end. Verse 19. What will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Verse 26. It pertains to many days in the future. Uh, This is very, very important for us to keep in mind. Now, I do want to make comment about uh, verse 19 when it talks about uh, the the indignation. It says the the period of indignation. Indignation is judgment. Indignation is judgment. In Ezekiel 22, 31, it's used that way. Thus I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their way I have brought upon their heads, declares the Lord. It's God's judgment. So the way it's used in verse 19, again, we're talking about this prophetic vision and the interpretation of it, the understanding of it. It's for the time when God's indignation is going to be happening. His judgment is going to be happening. That's at the end. That's a reference to the tribulation. So it's important to keep that in mind as we look at this, as we look at the interpretation of this whole thing. It's for the end of time. That point is is emphasized. Now, let's look at verses 20 through 22 as Gabriel unpacks this vision and and really just gives to, to Daniel, this is what it means. He says, the ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn uh, that is between its eyes is the first king. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms, which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. So, it couldn't be any simpler. It couldn't be any plainer, right? He says, listen, these, just as we saw in chapter 2, we saw in chapter 7, God is, is telling Daniel, uh, this is what's coming in regard to these world-ruling empires. But the focus today isn't on all of them. It's just on these two. So we go back. Uh, he says, it, the ram, uh, it, it, it's the, the kings of Media and Persia. So, so the, 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 the Medo-Persian Empire. I want to go back now and read again uh, the, the text from 3 and 4, verses 3 and 4. I lift up, lifted up my eyes and look, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. The two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. The ram was budding westward, northward, southward. No other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and magnified himself. And so uh, there, the, the, the two horns, this is the, the Medo-Persian Empire, and then the, the, the whole idea of the Medo-Persian Empire is it's represented by two powers. The Persians conquered the Medes, but they had an alliance with them in a sense. They were together. And so it wasn't just called the Persian Empire. It was the Medo-Persian Empire. But one was stronger than the other. The Persians were much stronger than the Medes, and so that's what's represented by the two horns, one being being stronger than the other. We we saw that in the the vision in chapter seven, with if you recall, it was the bear that was raised up on one side, and so the whole idea was there was some unequalness, some imbalance in the Medo Persian Empire. That's what's being represented here by the two horns. Now, going back again to that. That vision in chapter 7, we saw in that bear, representing the Medo-Persian Empire, they had uh, three ribs. The, the bear had three ribs in its mouth. And so here you've got uh, 
the, the, the three ribs. Uh, now you've got uh, this the ram budding in three directions. So, you know, you've got this, okay, there's three. There's three there, there's three here. They're speaking of the same thing. It's, it's the consuming in the sense of the ribs, he's eating meat, right? He's eating, the, eating something. In the sense of the Medo-Persian Empire, this is what they did. They, the Medo-Persian Empire spread, took on Babylonia, Syria, and Asia Minor in the west, Armenia, and the area of the Caspian Sea to the north, and into Africa in the south. So all God is saying is here, this is this world ruling empire that's, that's coming up, and this is what they're going to do. He's speaking this before it all is fulfilled. Now the goat comes up. Again, look at the, the text for the goat in chapter or verse 5. A male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes. So uh, the goat is the world-ruling empire that replaces the Medo-Persian empire, which clearly, Gabriel says, it's Greece, right? It's very clear. We, we, can, you know, we can see that. So um, the significant thing about the goat is it has this large horn, right? Again, you're talking about it, its symbol of power, its symbol of authority. And this large horn that's between its eyes, it ends up getting broken off and replaced by the four lesser horns. Well, here's the, here's the common understanding of this. And this is, no matter, uh, you know, a lot of theologians are divided about uh, some of the timeline of these things, uh, but this is very, very common, is, is that that large horn represents Alexander the Great. He was the leader who, uh, he led Greece to basically take over the known world. Again, we saw this two weeks ago. He led the army to conquer uh, from Greece in the west to India in the east. And so the picture of the goat is that he's coming from the west. And then you've got this whole description that he's, 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 he's moving over the surface of the earth without touching the ground. The, the picture there is, is that he's lightning fast. And again, that's, that's what we saw when we were looking at chapter 7. He took over this, this whole area of the known world in three years. It was incredible. He died about eight years after all of this conquering. After the conquering of Babylon, he died about eight years later. And he was not succeeded by another king. Rather, the, the, the rule of Greece was parceled out to his four generals. Right? Are you seeing this? It's like, it's like the, what he's describing is exactly, you know, or what happened in history is exactly what was described here. Uh, the, the, the large horn was broken off, and it was replaced by four lesser horns. His four generals uh, took over. They divided it all up, and, and you know, there was, there was battle in that, but, but they ended up kind of parsing out the whole thing. So... Uh, it describes now another horn. Verse, uh, was it verse 9? Out of one of these four came forth a, a, a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great. This one now towards the south, towards the east, and towards the beautiful land. The beautiful land is what? Do you guys know what the beautiful land is? You should know. It's Jerusalem. It's Israel. It's God's, it's God's promised land. And so, you know, as we look at history, we're looking for, okay, we, we understand that Alexander died. When Alexander died, the, the, the Greek empire was broken up into the rule of these four generals. But then one arose from them and he, in his power and his authority, went against God's people. Now, 
I want to pause right there because as we're seeking to understand this, there is something that uh, just kind of needs to be explained in regard to prophecy in general. One of the things that makes it difficult is uh, that biblical prophecies oftentimes have a near and a far fulfillment. Are you guys aware of that? There, there is oftentimes God's thinking, he's speaking about something that's about to happen, but it's a picture of something that's going to happen later. And that's certainly what we see here. Now, I want to give you an example of that. Uh, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 17. 1 Chronicles chapter 17. I'll give you a minute to turn there. I trust you guys enjoy these things. I, again, it's a kind of a technical, and we're going through these things. It's a little bit technical. I personally, I find these things to be so thrilling. I can't wait till we get, uh, probably not next week, but the week after when we get in the latter part of chapter nine. It's, these prophecies are incredible. But here's an example of a prophecy that comes with a near and a far fulfillment that's very, very easy to see. First Chronicles 17, uh, God speaking through the prophet Nathan, uh, close to the time of David's death. He says, when your days are fulfilled, uh, verse 11, when your days are fulfilled that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up one of your descendants after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build for me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And I shall not take my loving kindness away from him, as I took it away from him who was before you. But I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Nathan is a prophet. He's speaking to the king. He says, listen, your son... I'm going to establish your son. He's going to build me a house. His kingdom is going to be forever. So clearly, you, you understand the near fulfillment of that. God's speaking just literally of David's son, Solomon, who's going to build the temple. He's literally going to build the temple. That's the, that's the near fulfillment. But we also understand the far fulfillment. And that is that the son of David... Right? His eventual son is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's his kingdom that's eternal. So, so even, even as the, 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 the throne is going to be established under David and under David's son, eventually Jesus Christ is going to inherit that as the Savior. So I, I, I hope you get that. It's, it, God is speaking uh, you, you know, the, the prophecy is for the, a near fulfillment, and in this case, just years. And then down the ages, you know, with Jesus Christ, the ultimate fulfillment of this and his kingdom, as it says, it'll be established forever and ever. So I want to just give you that. That's just a really obvious example as we read it uh, of a prophecy that has both a near and a far fulfillment. Because that's one of the reasons why people get confused with some of these prophecies that Daniel gives. Uh, they have a, a near fulfillment as a type of that which is going to eventually come. Again, um, so we go back to, uh, back to verses 9 through 14. We've got this description of this little horn, because that's really the focus at this point, is we've got the, the four conspicuous horns, and then out of, one, out of those comes the little horn. And again, we're talking about the, 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 you know, the Greek empire. And so uh, here's the, the, not the qualifications, but kind of the things that this little horn is going to do. Because uh, we're trying to seek to understand who this guy is. Uh, first of all, he's going to go against Jerusalem. He's going to go against the beautiful land. Uh, he's going to persecute God's people. Now, it, it, that's a little bit difficult to understand. Uh, when we read it, it says... Uh, 
Where is the description of that? Look at verse 10. It says, he grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. He will even magnify himself equal to the commander. It's, that's difficult to understand. It's like, what is he talking about? Is he talking about angels or what? Well, if you go to chapter 12, uh, verse 3, we see some of that same language used that's a little bit diff- easier to understand. Uh, it says, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and those who lead the many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. And so there you have God's people likened unto the stars. So the picture that we have of this little horn is he's going to be trampling down not just Jerusalem, but God's people. I wouldn't say this is super simple to, to just kind of see, but when you, when you piece it all together, Scripture interprets Scripture, we see that that's what he's talking about, even to the point, so going against Jerusalem, going against God's people, even lifting himself up to be equal with God. The, the, the commander of the, the prince of the host is Jesus. Right, the, 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 the commander of the host, that's Jesus. And so this little horn, he lifts himself up to be equal. He stops the regular sacrifice. He has such power and such authority that he can put an end to religious observance for the Jews. He desecrates the sanctuary. And in his day, he seems to prosper. He seems to to be unabated. No one can stop this guy. But it's for a limited time. I mean, that's that's one of the really comforting things when you read this kind of things. He has a limited limited time to act. Now, if you've you've been around Bible studies like this in your life, you you understand who this figure is. The the near fulfillment is this guy... uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, if you understand history. He rose to power in the dynasty established under uh, Seleucus Nicantor. He was one of these four generals of Alexander's. He rose to power under him. And, and, and Antiochus Epiphanes was the guy who basically did these things. His, his name means God manifest. In fact, he had coins minted with his likeness that read, King Antiochus, God manifest, bearer of victory. Talk about arrogance. He lifted himself up to be equal with God. His detractors called him not Epiphanes, but Epiphanes, which means madman. A little play on words for the day, you know, on social media, they had memes. He was a madman. In the historical apocryphal uh, book of Maccabees, there is a, a reliable account. Of, this isn't scripture, but it's a reliable account of history of what this guy did. It says the king, Antiochus Epiphanes, he sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and to the cities of Judah, ordering them to follow customs foreign to their land, to prohibit burnt offerings, sacrifices, and libations in the sanctuary, to profane the Sabbaths and feast days, to desecrate the sanctuary and the sacred ministers, to build pagan altars and temples and shrines, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, to leave their sons uncircumcised, and to defile defile themselves with every kind of impurity and abomination so that they might forget the law and change all of its ordinances. Whoever refused to act according to the command of the king was put to death. It was reported that within a span of three days as he went in and took Jerusalem, that they slaughtered 40,000 Jews and took another 40,000 captive as slaves. He erected a statue of Zeus beside the temple's great altar, and he offered swine on the altar, an ultimate insult. He desecrated the temple. But this all went on for a limited amount of time. He came and went. 
So when we read verse 20 through 22, we read these descriptions of these world-ruling empires. God spoke about these things before they happened. And, and in history, we can look back and say, well, that was, for the most part, that was fulfilled. The Medo-Persian Empire rose and fell. The Greeks came under Alexander, rose and fell. Alexander died. The, 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 the rule was parceled out to his generals. From one of his generals arose this man, Antiochus Epiphanes, who did these things. Now, again, we understand that this prophecy that Gabriel is interpreting for Daniel, he tells him, this is for the future. This is for the, the end of time. And that's where we need to understand that even though we see a near fulfillment in this man, Antiochus Epiphanes, he's only a type. He's not the ultimate fulfillment. Let's read verses uh, 23 through 26. In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise Insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he will magnify himself in his heart. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. The vision of the evenings and the mornings, which has been told, is true. But keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. We're reminded, again, this is going to happen. When, when the transgressors have run their course, when, when, it, when, when God is done, basically, when he's done with the kingdoms of man, that's the, the whole idea by the, the time of the Gentiles is going to come to an end. Transgression is going to run its course. The times of the Gentiles began with Babylon and it's going to end in the future when the Lord returns. This language is of the man and who he will be, the, the man who will arise at the end. The descriptions of him are exactly the same or very similar to what this little horn does. And many have concluded, oh, this all happened in the past. They say, oh, well, it all is fulfilled under Antiochus Epiphanes. They're wrong. <laughs> They're wrong, clearly. The language seems to indicate something more, something yet to happen. Another ruler of which Antiochus is simply a type. He's the Antichrist. Right? This is the Antichrist, the beast of Revelation. Revelation. And, and when we go to chapter 9, we'll just give you a little preview here. Look over at chapter 9, verse 27, speaking of this same guy. He says, He will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. That one week is the period of the tribulation, that period of God's indignation. In the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offerings. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one uh, that is decreed, will, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Gabriel here is giving Daniel that interpretation as well. And he's describing someone who's going to desecrate the temple. He's going to put a stop to sacrifices, just as Antiochus did. And he'll bring abominations that are going to defile things, just as Antiochus did. And for those 
theologians who, who conclude, okay, this is just history. This has all just happened in history for us. Future for Daniel, but history for us. The problem is Jesus spoke about this. Jesus spoke about this in the sense of something that was yet to come. In Matthew 24, he, he speaks about this abomination of desolation, the same language that's used in Daniel 9.27. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet, he's referencing this verse. Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. I love that. It's like, let the reader understand. Do your homework. If you understand what Daniel was talking about, that one day there would be a guy who would arise, he would desecrate the temple, he would stand in the temple and declare himself to be God. That's the abomination of desolation. And so Jesus goes on, he says, those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. He's look out. Now, in Matthew 24, he's responding to the question presented in verse 3, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? It's not, hey, Jesus, what happened in the past? It's, Jesus, what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen at the end of the age? What's going to happen when you return? And Jesus points to this. He says, it's just like what Daniel wrote about. That's what's going to be happening. This was all spoken long after Antiochus Epiphanes' day. He's speaking about the ruler that will arise in the last days, who would arise and in similar fashion, desecrate an evidently rebuilt temple. It's one of the reasons why all eyes are on the Temple Mount. All eyes are on Jerusalem. And the Jews are ready to go. I don't know what it's going to take. Right? I, <laughs> I, I know this is kind of a joke, but I feel like I'd pull the trigger. It's like, ah, at some point, there is going to be some semblance of a temple rebuilt. And, you know, it could, it, it'll happen like that. It'll be rebuilt. And, 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 and in the last days, this Antichrist, he will do all these things. He will put an end to the sacrifices. He will proclaim himself to be God. He will present himself in the temple of God and claim to be God. Paul spoke about this very same thing. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's talking to the church that some had concerns that the day of the Lord had already happened, that somehow we missed it. And he says, oh, relax. He said, don't let anyone in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first. What is that? That's the falling away. Pay attention, church. It's happening. The falling away is happening now. I I, I, every day I read about somebody, somebody, even people that we know, who've just decided to walk away. The apostasy is going to come first. Then the man of lawlessness is going to be revealed. The son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Paul says that's going to happen. And, and that is going to precede the return of Jesus Christ. It's, I don't know about you, but I get, like, I get excited about this. I mean, it, 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 in one sense, the future is frightening because we know that we're going, to see, we're going to see the church deteriorate. We're going to see a lot of things deteriorate socially. We're going to see lawlessness seem to have its day. As it says, it says, it seems to prosper. Right? Do you guys see that? I mean, just, just think about what's happened in the last couple of years. Lawlessness is, is, is just, it just seems to be going, kind of going crazy. And it's going to continue. Back in verse 25, it says, through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. He will magnify himself in his heart. He will destroy many while they're at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes. But he'll be broken without, hum without human agency. Again, the prince of princes is Jesus. The Antichrist opposes Christ. 
by definition, he opposes Christ. Now, the good news is we've read to the end of the book, right? What does the end of the book tell us? Well, the end of the book tells us the exact same thing that Gabriel told to Daniel. He will be destroyed without human. It won't be a man-made cause. God will take care of this guy. And in Revelation 19, 19, we read about it. John says, I saw the beast and I saw the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ and the returning church after the rapture and at the return of Christ physically to the earth. And, and the, the armies of the world under the inspiration of this little horn, this antichrist, they'll have a, an ambition to make war. It's, it's like the ultimate definition of insanity, isn't it? It says he will be broken without human agency. And so we read the next verse, and the beast was seized. And with him, the false prophet, this is a, a religious leader that's going to give, uh, you know, give religious power to the, to the Antichrist. The, the beast is seized, the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received, he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. That's what's going to happen. And so God, through Daniel, he's given us this view. Of, as a type, we can look back in history and we can say, well, it happened exactly, you know, chapter 2, that vision. It happened exactly, right, with all those world-ruling empires. Chapter 7, the vision there, it happened with those world-ruling empires. Here, with specifically just the, the, the Medo-Persian Empire and the G Greek Empire that replaced it. And, and, and this little horn as a type that came up and became really powerful, went against God's people. All of that has happened. And, and the point of it is for us as believers, for Daniel, he didn't understand this. It would be impossible for him to understand it. It's like when we read about the things that are happening in the future yet. We read it and we see it's like, okay, all right, I'm holding on to the fact that we win. Right? That the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes back at the end and things are made right. Now, some of the other things, I'm not really sure what that's all about. So we hold on to what's really plain, what's really simple, what's really easy to understand, the things that he has revealed. And this is what he's revealed. He's in charge. And, and these world rulers, they come and they go. And they think they're something. You notice in between the, 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 the ram and the goat, one magnifies himself, one magnifies himself exceedingly. And so all the, the, these rulers, it's like, well, I'm better than that guy. I'm more powerful. I'm so good, I'm God. Will be the boast of the Antichrist. The major, the major theme of this book, and really the major theme of all of Scripture the kingdoms and the pride of man will all fall. Whether we're talking about us individually or as nations, world rulers, we're all, it's all going to fall when the king of kings returns. The pride of man and the rebellion against God needs to be dealt with. And as we're seeking just to kind of, you know, make this personal in application for our own lives, you need to re remember, kind of have in your brain, your sin is antichrist. My sin is antichrist. In its core, it's the same thing. I want to be in charge, right? I want to be in charge. Oh God, I know your word says this, but I, I think this. I know your word says I, I ought to do certain things and ought to not do other things, but I really want to do this, so I'm going to do it. And in a sense, that, that's the spirit of Antichrist that's in all of us. It's infected all of humanity. And, and as we consider that, there's really only two options 
for what to do about that. There's only two options. Either we humble ourselves and receive forgiveness for that sin, that pride, that error, or we'll deal with God at some point in the future. Which, when you read it, it's not good. Right? It just doesn't go good. Because the Bible says that the penalty for sin is death. And, and he will deal with sin. There's only two options. We either deal with it in this life at the cross of Jesus, or we deal with it in judgment. I think it's also important for us to keep in mind, we're near the end. Like I, I, I know that Paul believed that. Jesus spoke as though it was near. But we're certainly much nearer today, 2,000 years nearer, than when Paul wrote. And we see the signs, we see the things coming together in the world, in the culture. We see it coming to pass. And we should be mindful of that. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus said, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. When he arrived, he initiated the beginning of the kingdom of God. Now that will ultimately kind of come to a conclusion when he returns physically to the earth. But it's begun today. And we're either, we're either part of it or we're apart from it. He says, repent and believe in the gospel. Of course, you guys know the gospel is good news. It means good news, literally. And the good news is that another has taken your place. The sin that you commit, that I commit, another has paid for. Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary took the punishment for my sin so that I don't have to. Again, the, the theme of Daniel is, is the humbling of men. It's the humbling of kings. It's the humbling of nations. It's the humbling of the world. And the personal application is that you and I need to be humbled. To confess our sins. To repent of our sins. And to believe in Jesus Christ. Now again, this is all, it's a technical Bible study as we look at this. This prophecy as it's unfolded. Look at the last verse. I think there's something that's wonderful here as we consider, what do we do? What, what should we do with the knowledge of the things that are going to happen in the future? Daniel, after taking all of this information in, it says, I was exhausted and sick for days. This, what he saw was vivid and troubling. But then it just says, I got up again and carried on the king's business. I got up again and carried on the king's business. And that's my charge to you. Not, not to get freaked out. Like, like this is all going to happen. And, and we shouldn't be afraid. There's no sense we should be afraid. Again, you go back to all the, the previous lessons, chapters 1 through 6. We saw that God was able to keep his people. God was able to keep his people in the fire. God was able to keep his people in the lion's den. And God keeps the people who are trusting in him. That's our great hope. You don't have to be afraid of the Antichrist. No, we need to be busy about our father's business. And that business is, is holding on to faith holding on to the things that make for faith, right? Continuing to be involved in the old things, these old-fashioned things, prayer and worship and Bible study and going to church, being disciplined as Christians and not falling for the cultural trends of deconstruction and departing and apostasy. We need to hold on to these things in our day. And also, the king's business is the gospel. 
You and I carry the information that people need. The good news of Jesus Christ. That that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. People need to know that. Because everyone who dies, apart from Christ, will suffer the same fate as the Antichrist. And it's our job to tell them about Jesus. Well, I hope you're encouraged. (laughs) You know, it's it's crazy to take these things in. Uh, But like I said, it's, it's... I think there's this sense of when we know what's going to happen and we also understand that, that our king is victorious, it's, it's comforting. One day we're going to be with him and we should all be looking forward to that. Father, thank you for your word. God, I thank you for how you use Daniel to communicate these things that you gave to him uniquely. You gave him this vision, though it wasn't just him, Jesus spoke about these things. Paul wrote about these things. John wrote about these things. Lord, we have the full picture uh, that's pretty clear about what's going to happen in the last days. Lord, we want to give our lives to you. We want to be trusting in you, not afraid. Lord, not afraid of what's going on in the culture, not afraid of what's coming next, but looking for your arrival, looking for the rapture of the church. God, I pray that you'd keep us busy in the meantime, that we would be uh, Christians uh, walking in obedience, uh, walking in obedience in in a discipleship kind of way, but also in an evangelism way. Help us to share the good news of the gospel with others. People need to hear. And so we pray that you would use us in our day pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.